y'all, Dixie here. Now let's talk about footwear. And this is a tough one because no two people have the same stride or the same build of feet. So it's very difficult to pinpoint what will work exactly for you. And even if you get a pair of boots or a pair of trail runners and you go hike in with them before you hit the AT, you might find that when you get to the AT, even though that particular set of shoes worked for you out on day hikes or weekend trips, now suddenly they're not working for you on the AT. And that's very normal. So while it can be frustrating, just know that you may have to switch up several different things while you're out there to find the right thing that works for your feet. So now let's go into the whole boots versus trail runners argument. It's so silly to see people fight about this online as if there's like a one definitive answer that you know this type of footwear is king and all others are just stupid. I really think they both have their place and if boots seem to work well for you that's wonderful. If you prefer trail runners that's great. The thing is just figuring out what works best for you. So let's talk about some of the pros and cons for each. In the way of support of your foot in general and your ankles, boots probably take the cake because they're more rigid and they're gonna offer definitely more support from rocks or other things that you could trip on. But because they offer this protection and rigidity, they are usually a lot heavier than a typical trail runner. And if you don't need that ankle support, really, because your ankles will strengthen up as you go along, then why would you have extra weight on your feet that you don't need? Boots tend to be warmer than trail runners in colder temperatures, but they have less ventilation, so that could contribute to blister issues because your feet aren't drying out as quickly. And especially if it rains, your boots are gonna stay wet a lot longer than a pair of trail runners. And then in durability, boots tend to win the race on that. They'll last anywhere from 800 to 1,000 miles. And trail runners, depending on the pair, you may get 200 to 700 miles out of them. My personal experience with the boots versus trail runners thing, I started the AT in a pair of Loa hiking boots. And I thought, well, I'm going hiking, so I must need hiking boots. And I'm a clumsy person who I felt like would probably roll my ankle all the way down the trail. So it wouldn't hurt to have extra ankle support. I made sure that they were sized properly. And within about mm, 20 miles or so, I had a pretty gnarly case of tendonitis in my Achilles. When I got to the outfitter at Neil Gap, I talked to them about my issue and they suggested that it was likely from the boot drumming on my Achilles tendon and causing it some aggravation. So they suggested that I try switching to trail runners. So I sent the boots back. Luckily I had purchased them from REI, got a full refund and I purchased a pair of trail runners at Mountain Crossings and I have never considered going back to boots. Now, again, if you know you are a person that absolutely needs that extra ankle support, then by all means boots might be the thing that you need. But otherwise, I urge you to at least try the trail runners. Again, if you get them from REI and you decide they don't work for you, then you can always return them. But I would say 95% of people that through hike the Appalachian Trail do it in trail runners. With it being such a wet trail, you've got water crossings, it rains all the time. I think the best thing for your foot health is to have that breathability of a trail runner. That's just my two cents. If you want something that's kind of like boots and trail runners had a baby, then I know different brands, for example, like Ultra makes a mid shoe where it's just like a high top trail runner and that way you're getting a little bit more ankle support i would assume but then also the benefits of having a shoe that's more lightweight than a boot regardless of what type of shoe you decide to go with make sure that it is properly sized for your foot keep in mind that your feet will swell during the day while you're hiking because you're just beating the crap out of them stepping stepping all day and you'll probably end up sizing up a little bit if you make sure that they fit properly. A couple things that I recommend doing to make sure the shoe is properly fitted to your foot is lace it up comfortably, not super tight, and tap your toe on the ground. 
if your toe is hitting the front of your shoe, then it's not the right shoe for you. Because if you're doing that going downhill and your foot keeps slamming to the front of your shoe, chances are you're gonna lose a toenail. Another way that you can make sure that they're fitted properly for you is the old thumb test. And that's just when you're standing there comfortably, if you put your thumb down in front of the tip of your big toe, you should at least have a thumb width between the tip of your toe and the end of the shoe. Some of the shoe stores you'll go to, especially if you go to an outdoor store to get boots or trail runners, they may have a little rock ramp looking thing so you can simulate like you're walking downhill and again just make sure that the tips of your toes do not touch the front of the shoe because your toenails will fall off. Ask me how I know. In addition to not being too tight, your shoe also shouldn't be really loose because if your foot is sliding around in your shoe, that's going to cause increased friction and possibly contribute to a blister problem. Some other variations in footwear that you should probably consider is stack height and drop. Stack height is just the space between the ground or where the ground meets the bottom of the shoe and your foot. So that can vary depending on what brand, what style, trail runner or boot that you have. Some people want a very slim stack height so that they can feel what's under their feet. They like a more minimalistic type design. Some people have very tender feet, so they want more of a stack height and they don't wanna feel all the little pebbles and roots of the trail. If you don't know what you prefer, then just walk to the mailbox barefooted and you'll find out. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I mean, actually that will be somewhat telling if you are a tender-footed person or not. Um, but if you're really not sure, then maybe starting off somewhere midway, not super minimalist shoe, but also not something that's like platform shoe cushion under your foot. Drop in a shoe is where you'll see from your heel to your toe that it kind of slopes down. So there's a drop in the space from your heel to the ground and your toe to the ground. Most of the shoes that we wear, our heels are higher than our toe area. There are brands out there like Ultra, for example, that you'll see has zero drop shoes. And that just means that there's no drop, so the heel and the toe are at the same level. This can be beneficial for some people and also it can cause some hikers issues. I've heard of people saying that a zero drop shoe helped them significantly with plantar fasciitis. I feel like it's helped prevent mine from being an issue again, but for some people it can be very problematic and cause plantar fasciitis. Basically with a zero drop shoe, if your heel is not high up and it's come down, then you're stretching your calf muscle more. So as long as that doesn't hurt you or cause too much strain in your body, then it, it can be a good thing to be stretched out. But for some people, adding that extra pull on their calf muscle can kind of irritate that whole line from the calf muscle to your Achilles tendon and into the plantar fascia. So the best thing you can do if you're gonna try a zero drop shoe is probably not do it in the middle of a through hike. Uh, instead, test them out before you go, walk around town, see if they, they cause you any issues. If you're already out hiking and going on weekend trips and stuff, then that would be a good time to try something like that out where you know, okay, yeah, this is gonna be fine or this definitely doesn't work for me. And they can take a while to break into, but anyway, there's no shame in having a shoe that has a drop in it, but just something that you'll notice differences in between different design shoes. So basically the recap on all of that is if you can get your footwear from REI, go in there, try it on in person, make sure it's a proper fit and feel good about going to the trail with it, then at least you can also feel good knowing that if it doesn't work out, REI will honor that return year through hike. Chances are, whether you go with a boot or a trail runner, you'll need to replace your shoes before you get to the end of the trail. I don't remember exactly how many pairs of trail runners I went through, but it was several. I personally try to replace my trail runners at about 500 miles, no more than 500, sometimes even at 400. And I learned that lesson the hard way on the AT. I was at about 
700 miles with a pair of trail runners and they were still seeming to function properly. I had decent tread left, but what I didn't realize is most of the support was gone in the shoe and therefore my arch was hyperextending and upsetting my plantar fascia and I ended up with a case of plantar fasciitis. So while your shoes might look okay, make sure that you're getting enough support so you don't end up having an issue. And I promise you, if you end up having an issue, you'll wish that you just spent that extra money and bought a new pair of shoes. Just a word on Gore-Tex with footwear. A lot of things I'm like, you know, you decide what works best for you, but this is one of those things that I would definitely not recommend for through hiking, especially for the Appalachian Trail where it rains a lot. If you're not familiar with Gore-Tex, it's a technology designed to make a material like your shoes waterproof, but supposedly to still allow water vapor to escape. But I promise you that if you have one foot in a Gore-Tex shoe and the other foot in a very well ventilated shoe, the Gore-Tex shoe is going to cause your foot to be more sweaty and damp and it's going to trap in more moisture than the well ventilated shoe. This could cause blisters or possibly even something like trench foot from wearing them day after day. But having a waterproof shoe sounds wonderful, doesn't it? Especially if it rains. But if it rains and you're on a long distance hike and you're out in it all day long, you will see that most of your body will end up wet anyway, even if you have rain gear on, because if it's not from the rain, it's gonna be from the sweat. And you know, kicking up water while you're walking on your ankles, even if you have rain pants on, it can wick down into your socks and into your shoes. And I'm just telling you, if it rains, even if you have waterproof shoes, your feet, will be wet. Now, if you were to have like rain pants with waterproof gaiters over the top of it, and then your Gore-Tex shoes, then yes, possibly they could stay dry, but then again, you'd probably be wet with sweat. Gore-Tex shoes take longer to dry out than non-Gore-Tex shoes. And then you've got the issue of water crossings. Now, I know some people think that they will stop and take their shoes off, for every little puddle or water crossing and then put their shoes and socks back on the other side to keep their feet dry. But at some point when you're doing 20 something miles per day, you just can't care about that anymore and you're probably gonna plow through. So again, if you've got the Gore-Tex, they're not gonna dry out as quickly as if you have the more ventilated non-Gore-Tex shoes. So you can do what you want, but I would highly, highly recommend choosing not Gore-Tex for specifically through hikes and the Appalachian Trail. The only time that I would say for the AT that I would potentially find Gore-Tex shoes desirable is if I was going to be hiking in the snow and I knew it wasn't gonna rain. Other than that, wouldn't do it. Finally, one other option that I should mention with backpacking footwear is hiking sandals. These are certainly not very common on a through hike like the Appalachian Trail, but every year you'll see at least a one or two handful of people that do attempt to through hike the AT and Sandals. And in 2015, when I was out there, I met a guy named South Pole who did complete his through hike wearing sandals the whole time. But when we met, he was nursing his toe that he had broken kicking a log or a rock or something like that and he said that when he did it well it hurt really badly but he looked down at his toe and it was like facing another direction <laughs> so with that said sandals are certainly an option if that's what you want to try out your feet will stay very ventilated they will dry quickly if they get wet so there are some pros to having backpacking sandals but your feet will definitely not be as protected and injuries could occur to slow down your hike or potentially even stop it. So just keep that in mind. Insoles. Insoles are kind of difficult, just like other footwear to recommend because everybody's feet are so different. I've tried several different brands and types of insoles. Some people will never need insoles and they'll be fine with the factory insole that comes in their boot or trail runner. But if your 
finding that your foot seems to need a little extra support or a little something different than insoles are something that you can try. On the AT, I first tried the Sole brand of insoles and I liked these because you put them in the oven, let them heat up, then put them inside your footwear and step down on them and they mold to your feet in particular, which I thought was kind of cool. My feet ended up having some swelling later on in the trail, so I thought, well, maybe it's time to replace my insoles. And I heard a lot of people bragging on super feet. So I got a pair of super feet. They make different types of super feet. But the ones that I tried, honestly, I didn't really notice anything super different. So at that point, I tried Dr. Scholl's for plantar fasciitis insoles, which were cheaper than the Soul brand insoles or the super feet. I think both of those ran 40 to $50 or so. And the Dr. Scholl's for plantar fasciitis, I believe is close to $20. And I made sure to stretch and do some other things, but I do think that the Dr. Scholl's for plantar fasciitis insoles helped me a lot. I'm to the point now where I can actually wear factory insoles and they seem to do fine with my feet, but you'll have to figure out what your feet are telling you. And if you're not listening, then trust me, they will tell you louder. If you do end up having foot issues, of course, your best bet for insoles is going to a podiatrist and getting custom made orthotics, but that is pricier, I guess, depending on whether your insurance pays for it or not, than of course from getting some insoles from a regular department store. Just a little tip that I wanna add that I found out about on the Pacific Crest Trail during my through hike out there is the wonderful invention of lock laces. They're basically just elastic laces that you thread through in place of your shoelaces. And then there's an adjustable plastic piece that slides on on the end. You can just tighten the little plastic piece if you want your laces tighter or loosen it if you want them more loose. And I think that they are wonderful because I'm sure that I've wasted hours of my life tying and even double knotting the laces on my shoes. As long as I replace them each time, I replace my trail runners, I haven't had any issues. Now I wanna cover camp shoes. Camp shoes are really a luxury item, but for the AT, I would say most people have camp shoes or they at least start off with camp shoes and if they decide they don't like them or need them, then they can mail them home. After a long day of hiking, there's not much that feels nicer than peeling off your stinky shoes and socks and putting on some comfortable camp shoes. In camp shoes, I'm looking for something that's lightweight and allows my feet to breathe. I went with lightweight Teva foam sandals because that's just what I had at home. A lot of people wear Crocs and it's actually socially acceptable to do so on trail because they're also comfortable, lightweight, allow your feet to breathe. In addition to wearing them at camp after a long day of hiking, it's nice to have something to wear in town. But again, this is not a necessity. And if you decide to not have camp shoes, then that's perfectly acceptable also. After the Appalachian Trail on other trails that I've hiked, I eventually ditched my camp shoes and if I was to go do the AT tomorrow, I would not take them, but I'm not particularly tender-footed, so I can walk around barefoot at camp and it doesn't kill my feet. Now let's talk about some socks. There are a lot of different brands and styles of socks out there and different materials used, but I would say 99% of hikers use merino wool socks. Merino wool is all soft and cozy and it's not like your pawpaw's army blanket that is painful and scratchy. It regulates temperature well, which helps prevent your feet from getting all sweaty and gross. It's also a natural antimicrobial, so they won't be quite as stinky as they would in say synthetic socks. And most wool socks these days use synthetics a little bit anyway, just to help them keep their shape better, dry more quickly, and to be more durable. After trying many brands of socks, I would say Farm to Feet is my favorite merino wool sock for backpacking, but a close second is Darn Tough. I think Farm to Feet are just a little bit more comfortable, but Darn Tough has better color options, so 
Anyway, they're right there neck and neck, but what I really appreciate about both of these companies is that they offer a lifetime guarantee on these socks. So they pretty much dare you to wear a hole in them, and if you do, they will happily replace them with a new pair of socks. So yes, they are a little on the pricey side. These pairs of socks can run anywhere from $15 to $20, but when you buy them, you have that pair of socks for life or again, a replacement. Also for people who are blister prone and you may not figure that out until you get out there on the trail, but if you start having blisters, specifically because two of your toes are rubbing together while you hack, then you might wanna think about toe socks. The only brand of toe socks that I have personally tried are in Gingy's they still end up with holes in them a lot faster than my darn tufts. I've had darn tufts and farm defeat make a whole hack before. Uh, but if you're plagued with blisters and you need to reduce that friction between your toes, then it's definitely worth it to have the Gingy socks. You can also get toe sock liners that are thinner and will reduce that friction, but you could put those under a normal wool sock. You can get socks that are all different lengths from no shows to all the way up to your knee if you want to. There are also different cushion options, so you might switch this up depending on the season or for example, I knew a guy on the AT that was seriously allergic to poison ivy and poison oak, so he didn't want to take any chances and he wore knee-high socks the entire trek. I prefer to have a little bit of variety in the socks that I'm carrying. Normally, I have at least two pair to hack in. I've been known to sometimes carry even three pair to hack in and then one pair to sleep in. So. For hiking, I might have a three-quarter length and a crew sock with light cushion in colder temperatures. And then at night, to keep my feet warm, I'll have a crew sock with a lot of cushion. For warmer weather, I like to have no-show socks with no cushion. And I might still have a little bit of variety and have up to a three-quarter length sock. Even in the summertime, I like to at least have a three-quarter length sock just in case I have issues with the no-shows. Sometimes I've had a no-show that seems like my shoe wants to eat it for a particular reason and it'll start slinking down into my shoe or maybe even it'll go below the top of the shoe and my ankle will get rubbed, but this will just happen on a random day or something. So I'll switch out and then maybe a couple days later it's okay again. Also, I've had particular sections that seem to be drier or dustier where I'll get some grit just on the inside lip of the no-show sock that can cause some abrasion. And this has especially happened in warmer temperatures when I've had snow, which won't be an issue on the AT. If you're seeing snow, then it's definitely cold out and you probably want a longer sock anyway. But just something to keep in mind if you've not used no-show socks a lot, they can sometimes be problematic or at least they have been for me. So I like to have a backup, but I just really do love the no-show socks, just the way they look, the way they feel, they're cool, etc. On to gaiters. It's normal to get some debris in your shoe. Every now and then you might get a pebble or some sand or something like that. And at breaks, you might dump your shoes out. But if you find yourself having to stop frequently because you've got a lot of debris and crud in your shoes or if you're having issues like I was talking about before with your socks getting a lot of trash and in the little lip of the sock and it's causing abrasion issues on your foot, then you can try out gaiters. Most of the gaiters I saw on the trail were lightweight and low rise on the ankle. They just hugged the lower ankle and overlapped the top covering of the shoe. There are a lot of different varieties of gaiters out there. You can get some that are heavy duty and waterproof. I feel like that's kind of overkill for the AT, but if that's something that you wanna check out, then they do exist. But myself personally, I just found that gaiters were kind of a hassle, just something else that I had to deal with. And I don't really have to dump out my shoes often enough that I felt like gaiters would be useful enough for me. Two of the more popular brands of gaiters I've seen are Dirty Girl Gaiters. You can get crazy with the cheese whiz and pick all sorts of colors. And two, Outdoor Research has some more tame gaiters, but they seem to work equally as well. 
All right, y'all, well, that is all I have for you on today's topic. Next up, I'm gonna be covering clothing and rain gear. If you wanna check that out, you can click right here. If you wanna see one big video with all of this information split up by timestamps, you can check that out down here. Or if you wanna watch my through hike of the AT, then you can check that out down below. Thank y'all so much for watching, and we will see y'all next time.